So this is joint work with uh, Marty Eichenbaum, who's here in the audience, and Mat uh, Matthias Trabant, with the three of us who did a lot of work uh, on COVID. And then this is yes, also with uh, Miguel Godin de Matz, who's uh, from the Portuguese Catholic University, and Francisco Lima, who's the president of the uh, Portuguese Statistical Institute. And we use, we use the data from, from that institute. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping this is one of the last times we present the papers about COVID, because if, if, we, <laughs> if we go back on the road presenting these papers, it's because COVID came back. So I hope that's not a, uh, uh, not, uh, not the setting we're, we're, we're going to go back into. But uh, yeah, if you've seen me present, I've started many times these presentations with this picture of my family. This is my mother's family. And it's, this is my mother. Um, let see if this points. Um, this is my grandmother. This is my great-grandmother, Elisa. And uh, the reason I'm showing this picture is because she had eight children. And out of those eight, five died in the fall of 1918 uh, with the so-called Spanish flu. Uh, so I always, as I grew up, like hearing about, about this event, I never thought one day, you know, we would live through, a, through, a, through an epidemic. Um, so it's a little bit hard to work on these topics because they are about life and death. You know, we, we are used to talk about consumption smoothing, which seems to be <laughs> not as important. So, uh, I mean, this paper uh, starts with the, uh, the question of how come the COVID recession was so tough? Because in the end, actually, case fatality rates for COVID were quite low. And, uh, and the unemployment rate went to and 15%. So the drop in output was seven times uh, that that you see in a normal recession. And yet, uh, there's these studies by Asimoglu and Johnson and other authors where they study what's the impact on output of uh, the very large decreases in mortality from infectious diseases. And you don't see very, very large in economic impact. So you see COVID comes, actually the case fatality rate is quite modest in the end. I mean, it was quite tragic for the people that died. But we, we had a huge impact on output. And then if you look in historical data, uh, infectious diseases became much less deadly and we don't see a commensurate big impact on economic activity. So what's going on? We're going to try to explain, uh, reconcile these two facts, and we're going to look at uh, the impact of different uh, COVID waves. Um, and the impetus for this work was this data set that, that became available um, for Portugal. It's a data set that allows us to construct individual spending, high-frequency individual spending for a huge fraction of the, of the population, potentially. So we're going to study that from January 2018 to April 2021. And the reason is that in April 2021, then vaccines became widely available. And also the Delta variant changed the character of transmissions because it was more infectious. Um, so we are going to construct uh, uh, expenditure data using electronic receipts that are used to, uh, as part of the VAT reporting. And, you know, if, of course, the data is anonymous, so we don't know. We don't know who it has been anonymized. That's very important. Uh, and it does not include the data. In the data, because VAT is not collected, we don't have rents or, or mortgage payments or anything like that. But of course, those are also the type of expenditures that are not likely to have reacted to the COVID shock. Um, you know, people always ask, how so come you, you can construct this data? And it's because Portugal, as part of this debt crisis in 2011, put a lot of uh, programs to, to fight fiscal evasion, in particular with VAT. And so the population was given both carrots and sticks, you know, so they would, they would ask for receipts. In Portugal, everybody knows their, their fiscal number by heart. Uh, even my mother who's 90, she knows her fiscal number. And, and if, you know, if you get the cup of coffee, then you give the fiscal number. And then this gets reported and, and you can construct spending. So, you, you know, as, a, as incentives, if you, if you have the receipts, you can deduct some expenditures from the income tax. You can get a little bit of a rebate from the value-added tax that was paid. And there's also a lottery. You know, in the beginning, the use, people used to receive cars. Now they receive government bonds, which is a bit less flashy. Um, uh, and there's also fines, actually, if, if, if people fail to, to ask for the receipt. So, so, you know, compliance is pretty good. So, so um, I have a question about the data. It's only uh, final consumption, or you also have the VAT receipt of intra -firms? No, no, this is for so consumers, okay. consumers only. So this there is no, no input output? No, no. Okay. So just, this is just final consumption. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we, we could potentially compute consumption for 6.3 million people, but we have a sample of 500,000, and we're actually going to study a subset of that sample. Um, 
So we're going to look, uh, most of the work that I'm going to show you is going to be actually on civil servants. And the reason we focus on civil servants is because otherwise you have two confounding effects. If you look at the general population, you don't know whether people cut their consumption to protect themselves from, from the epidemic. You know, they, they don't want to go to shopping centers, they don't want to go to restaurants and so forth because they're afraid of contagion. We don't know whether there was a driving force or whether people fear that they were going to lose their jobs and therefore, you know, they, they are just doing precautionary savings. I, I, I see a lot of uncertainty and I start saving. So in the case of public servants, uh, I mean, these people have tremendous job security. So we don't think the second effect, I'm going to cut my consumption because I want to do some precautionary savings. So we, we don't think that effect is, is important. And so you are seeing the effect of the epidemic. So we're going to focus on, on, on this set of uh, uh, people. We also, as a robustness in, in the paper, we have results also for people who are retired. So those people are not working and, and you don't have this, uh, you, know, you know, they don't worry about losing their jobs because they're not working. Presume you're going to bring this up, but a, a lot of the uh, cut, the fall in GDP must must have been be a policy uh, created fall. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. So there's. So, so you you're going to. I'm going to talk about it. Yeah, of course, the containment, right? Right. Um, so uh, these are the case fatality rates uh, that. Uh, are estimated for Portugal, and they are very similar in, in different countries. So what you see here is young people, uh, in particular people that are younger than 49, they have very low probability of dying from COVID. But as, as people uh, become older, or as I like to call them, more experienced, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, then, then actually there's quite a non-linear increase in, in case fatality rates. Um, so this is the uh, empirical specification that, uh, that we're going to use. Um, we're going to regress uh, the log of expenditures for every individual in the sample, and there's going to be a time trend, there's going to be some seasonality effects, some monthly dummies, there's going to be fixed effects at the individual level. We're going to allow the fixed effects to interact with seasonalities, perhaps different professions, you know, for example, if you're a fisherman, perhaps your seasonality is different. Um, and then uh, uh, we are going to see... Um, what happens before and after, and, uh, and after the epidemic? So this, uh, this uh, capital delta is going to measure for the group of young people, which in this sample is people that are between the ages of 20 and, and 49, uh, how did they change their spending? And then this is a, a series of other um, estimates that capture the change in spending for other age groups. Um, and so this is what the data looks like. And, and what's nice about, I must say, these data is that this picture is extremely robust. You know, so the data does not have to be tortured to confess. Uh, it's, it's something that comes out, it emerges very, very naturally. And, and what it shows, uh, it shows you kind of the two waves. Uh, uh, you know, there's kind of three waves. There's this one, this is a second one, and then this is a third one. And what you see here is, is the older people, which here is, is ages 70 to 79. We throw out of the sample people that are older than 80 because they tend to live in retirement homes. And we also throw people that are younger than 20 because they, they tend to live with their parents. So, uh, Can you repeat what the, uh, the, the regression, the thing is that's on the vertical, the vertical axis? So I'm showing the impact of, of COVID on the expenditure of people of different ages. Right, so so I'm summing actually that. So this here is the impact of COVID on people that are young, age 20 to 49. And then for every group that is older, there's going to be a differential relative to this group. So I'm showing the sum of these two coefficients. Um, so for the young, is just that that capital delta. So you see it right here. So you can see, you know, the response of people aged 20 to 49 and those aged 50 to 59 is very very similar. You see. Notice that there's a lot of data, so standard errors are small, that's what these bars are. Um, so when you look at people in their 60s, they cut consumption by a lot more, and when you look at people in their 70s, then they cut consumption even more. Right? In this data, do you also have the number of people that are not if they do an expenditure in Amazon, do you see it? An expenditure, expenditure in Amazon or eBay yes. through the internet? Yes. Because, um, I mean, there are also this, this credit card data by Pete Kleiner. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there was a lot of shifting in the... Right, so, so this is including the data. The one thing that's not included, but uh, 
uh, I mean, every indication I have suggests it's very small, is we don't have uh, purchases from foreign, uh, for example, if you hire, if you send something from Amazon UK, that's actually not in the data. Because okay, it and so the next question, I think it, this is super interesting, I love it. Um, so, so next question, is there any way that you can cut through people that have more access to internet and people that don't. Because again, like for those people that don't, you might see those may account for the response because the other may, may I mean, there is a lot of evidence in the chatty data and the rush chatty data that the younger population was buying everything through internet and it actually stayed that way. Right, so you know we can do some cuts. So you, you're right. Our impression is that it's more the young people that have uh, that have access to to internet. But overall, internet so internet purchases are in the data. They are relatively small, uh, so they, we don't think in this data this is a big driving force. Um, so now I want to show you the perils of writing a, a paper in real time. Never never do that. You need the data to calm down. So we wrote a paper. I mean, we are stuck at home, right? And this data becomes available. We are working like 24 hours a day, and um, and then it's like beautiful. I mean, this picture emerges. And, you know, we had worked on these models where people protect themselves from the epidemic by cutting consumption. Now, if I'm older, I'm much more likely to die if I get infected, so I want to cut my consumption by more. So that's what our models implied. And then we set up like a really simple model where people make choices, and it produces the model, produces this picture. I mean, we are so happy. And then the problem was the, the life went on. Right, so then... And of course, then there were other waves. And then you see now, all of a sudden, the model does not work. And the reason is the following. Uh, this is the first wave, which is now, in retrospect, looks tiny. <laughs> you, you know, it doesn't even look like a wave. This is a very small um, number of cases relative to the second and the third waves, which were gigantic, right? Then when you look at the cut in spending, it was similar in the two waves. <laughs> I mean, you still have the, the fact that old people, that is good throughout, right? Old people cut spending by a lot more than young people. But what you see here is the, the probability of getting infected here was huge. And people didn't seem to uh, cut spending by nearly, you know, they cut spending by about almost as much as, as, as they did. Excuse me? No, no. That, so here, there, no. They, yeah. So in this data, just like towards the very end, there's a little, vaccines became available to old people, actually, to most of the people that are not even in the sample. And so the vaccines were not available. That's why, that's why we cut the sample. All right? When did the vaccine get? The vaccines started being uh, available to the population gradually in April. Of 21. April 21. So that's the end of our sample. And some older people got the vaccine before. Uh, but but uh, uh, it was only made available to 2021. The Excuse me. It started with, uh, old people. Yeah, they started with with the people in their 90s, then in the 80s. There was very few vaccines in the beginning. All right. So do you see the problem? The problem is that uh, you know we had a paper that worked really well, and now it gets destroyed by the data because the, the second wave is gigantic, you know, compared to the first wave. Uh, you know, I'm showing you deaths and then, and then kind of estimates of, of, of infections. But either way you look at the second, the second and third wave are gigantic. I mean, this almost looks very little. And the drop in spending is, is, uh, is similar in, the, in, in these waves. All right, so, so what's going on? Um, so... Uh, the other result that I want to show you is uh, what happens or, uh, across income, because obviously older people in general, they, are, they have higher income than, than younger people. So I'm showing you the effects of age in that picture, so older people get consumption by more. Uh, but it could, it could just be that these people have higher, yeah, higher, higher wealth or higher income, right? And... Um, that's an implication of the model. It's an implication that non-economists find quite crass, and maybe they are correct. But in this model, there's something which is the value of life. This is what you give up if you die. And if you're wealthier, you're giving up more. So wealthier people should self-protect more because they have more, more, more to lose. Something that non-economists find quite distasteful. Um, so, so let me show you what happens if you cut by income. So, so these are the three brackets of the, of the income taxes in Portugal. So this is below 20,000 euros per, per, per year. And you can see these people cut again. The old always cut more uh, than the middle-aged, and, and the middle-aged cut more than the young. 
Um, but you can see that the, the people that have low income cut by less than the people that have middle income and the people that have high income cut by the most. So this is exactly what the model implied. This was also in our first version of the paper. We're quite happy to see them. Not only did all people cut by more, but also across all three income groups, it, was, it went exactly the right way. Um, we also looked at uh, comorbidities, so we can use data on um, how much people spend in the pharmacy. Uh, and, and we select people that have a, uh, are in the top decile of, of pharmacy spending for their age group. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So we, the reason this is important is because that's a proxy for perhaps they, they have other diseases. And if you have other diseases like cancer or diabetes, you're more likely to die from cancer, from COVID. And so you can see here, these are the people that have no comorbidities in the sense they don't spend a lot on, uh, they don't have a lot of pharmacy expenditures. And they indeed cut by less than the people that have comorbidities. So you see another example of sort of people protecting themselves. If I think that I'm more at risk, then I tend to be more careful, and you see that uh, in the way people spend, spend money. Sergio, uh, how, were you serious when you said that maybe old, uh, people with a lot of money value life more? Did you mean yes, I was, yeah. Because cause that, that, in that case, I wanted, there's another p a possibility, which is that uh, poor people are basically buying uh, bread and water, Yes, yeah, possible too, yes. And then the old guys, uh, sorry, the rich guys are buying bread and water and... Uh, yeah, so there, you know, there could be subsistence. Yeah, yeah. And they, uh, so yeah, that poor people don't have much to cut because they are buying essentials. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a possibility. But less so for these two groups here, right? So these two groups, uh, you know, you think those subsistence effects would be lessened. Uh, and so the, these people do cut their consumption by a lot more than, than the middle income people. Uh, but I think that's a possibility for people that have uh, quite low income. Um, so we do a lot of robustness analysis in the paper, um, you know, as we gave the paper and, you know, we, we get referees and so forth. And so uh, uh, you, you can look at the paper for a variety of uh, robustness. Yes? Yeah, a quick, quick question. I mean, they cut consumption, but it's not only because of the COVID. When you are in the crisis, the same empirical uh, phenomenon does appear, right? But remember that these are people that don't have any income risk. So these are all civil servants. That's why, that's why we focused on civil servants. You know, otherwise, you're absolutely right. It would be extremely hard to disentangle. So we look at civil servants, and then one of the robustness that we do is we look at retirees. So these are people that are not worried about losing their jobs because they are not working. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you. Um, so you know, we try other specifications of the, of the regression. Um, we also, uh, you know, look at sectors. So we're going to talk a little bit more about lockdowns, which Mick brought up. But so we do the analysis for the sectors that were least affected by the lockdowns. And again, you see the same thing. So you can select the sectors where lockdowns were not important, and you see the same picture. Um, another uh, thing that you might worry about is over time, um, there was adaptation to COVID, right? So for example, restaurants started selling their meals through takeout. Uh, and so perhaps uh, over time, they just the economy adapted. Supermarkets had delivery, restaurants had takeout. So we also redo the analysis, taking away the sectors where there was adaptation. And again, you see the same, the same kind of pictures. I just bring up my question again. So, uh, I, you know, I I'm going to go back to your question. I have not answered it, but yes. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I don't know exactly how it was administered in Portugal, but, you know, a lot of services in uh, where I live were just unavailable. So we had to cut our consumption of those services. Correct. And then in the Omicron wave, the same thing happened. They, they cut down their services. So, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that for many, uh, for many consumption items, that the consumption drop was the same. Right, so, but that's what we do. We take out all of those items of consumption, and you still see the same picture, okay. all right? So that's one of the ways you can get at it. I think your, your point is well taken. Um, all right, so, so let me start with the model. So, so th these are the facts. I showed you the main picture. So again, remember, so in some sense, everything worked uh, and, and agreed with the, the, the models that, that we put together during the COVID crisis. And, and those models imply that if you're older, you are more at risk of dying, so you should cut your consumption by more. If you're richer, you actually have more to lose, so, so you should cut your consumption by more. And you see that very clearly in the data. But then you see that across these two waves, even though the, the second and the third wave were much more dangerous because there were so many infections. Um, 
um, people did not cut the consumption by a lot more in the second and thir third wave than in the first wave. So those are kind of the basic facts that, uh, that, that we, we, we document. And now we're going to try to uh, come up with a model uh, that, that explains these facts. Uh, and remember, we also want to, to come back to the question of how come the COVID crisis was so tough and how come when you see decreases in mortality from infectious diseases, which were quite significant, it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on economic activities. You'd expect these things to be symmetric. So uh, before I show you the, more, uh, the quantitative model, I want to show a simple model for intuition. So this is going to be a two-period model. Uh, the probability of dying depends on how much I consume in period one. So if I go to, the, to a restaurant, you know, I'm more likely to get infected, I'm more likely to die in period two. Um, there's going to be bequests, and bequests play a, an important role, and we're going to have recursive preferences. So we have Epstein-Zinn-style preferences to, to separate risk aversion from intertemporal substitution. So this is the simple model. So this is uh, uh, Epstein-Zinn uh, utility. Um, we derive utility from consumption in the first period, and in the second period, this is the certainty equivalent of, of lifetime utility. And the certainty equivalent of lifetime utility is written in this uh, second equation. So I'm going to die with probability delta of C1. You see, this is quite a grim uh, calculation. Uh, and the people that die, they leave a bequest. And this is the utility of a bequest. Of course, you need bequests because you need to be uh, consistent with the fact that people tend to leave a lot of assets behind. You know, I, I saw this car drump, driving with a bumper sticker saying, I'm spending my child's inheritance, but those people are uh, outliers. And most people uh, die with a lot of assets. So this is the utility from, from leaving a bequest. And this is the utility of consumption. So I'm going to come back to this equation over here, to this uh, comparison here. Um, because one of the conditions we need to impose is that you prefer to consume than to leave a bequest. If you prefer to leave a bequest, then your lifetime utility would be negative, <laughs> and then you'd prefer to die. So you don't want to have an economy where people prefer to die than to live. So you always have to keep utility positive in these, in these settings where you have control over health outcomes. Um, so I'm going to set the interest rate to zero just to simplify notation. So this is the... Uh, budget constraint of the household they consume t today or, or tomorrow. Um, if they die, their planned consumption becomes a bequest. So I'm not sure whether I'm going to be around in period two. If I'm around, you know, I consume. If I'm not around, then I leave a bequest and I get some utility from, uh, from leaving a bequest. So again, to mimic what's going to happen in the uh, epidemiology model, here we're going to make it very simple. If I consume more, uh, then I'm more, likely to, um, I'm more likely to perish in period two. And we're going to set up the model so that uh, beta is greater than 0.5, and I, I much prefer to consume in period two than in period one. Why do you need this assumption regarding uh, the mortality probability? No, so because... The richer you are, the, the lower your mortality probability, at least at, at young ages. No, no, so th this is going to mimic what's going to happen in an in a, in a epidemiological model. Because what happens is if I consume a lot, the, some forms of consumption bring me in contact with the rest of the population. I'm more likely to be infected, I'm more likely to die. I'm not looking about, uh, at the cross-section, and I'm not thinking about differences in access to well, health uh, healthcare or anything like that. I'm thinking during COVID, if, you, if, you con if I consume more than you, you know, I'm more likely to get exposed to the disease and I'm more likely to die. And this is just a reduced form way of putting that into the model. But then to some extent we fall back on uh, Esther's comment about um, online purchases. And Again, these purchases were not very important in the data. Uh, so, so, I mean, we can debate them, but, but uh, in the, empirically they're not very important. <laughs> the point is even when we control for the online purchases, consumption goes down. I mean, you can exclude them. Again, they are a small fraction of total spending, so they are a little bit of a, uh, they are not central to the question. In Portugal, the health, I mean, people working in the health sector, in clinic, in hospitals, are public servants or not? In France, people who work in some, most of the hospitals are public servants. So does your data include uh, the health sector? Uh, I, no, I believe not. I don't, I don't think so. So this, these are people that work in the public administration. Excluding? Yeah, ex I think so. But I, I, this is a good question. I'm going to check on this. Um, so, so let me. So again, I, I explained the reason why we have. We just discussed a little bit. So we really need this uh, this condition, and this is something that people that work in health economics 
uh, I've recognized quite a, quite, a, quite, a, quite a while ago, is that you need situations where people prefer to live than to die because you have control over your health uh, outcomes. So you don't want situations where you prefer to be, um, to be dead. Um, so let me show you a little bit the impact of intertemporal substitution and, and risk aversion. So I'm comparing here an economy uh, where people might die in, in the second period and their probability of death is, incre is increasing in consumption. So the more I consume today, again, what we were just debating, right? So if I consume more today, I probably get into contact with more people. If I get into contact with more people, I'm more likely to be infected and because of that, I'm more likely to die. So consumption is dangerous in, in, this, econ in this economy. And that's the economy with the, represented by the blue line. The economy represented by the orange line is an economy where I, I, I'm going to live for sure in, in period two. So you see here first uh, what happens with, with intertemporal substitution. So what is the calculation that the agent is carrying in their head? It says, well, the problem is I'm now in an uncertain environment and I might die in period two. So all things equal, I would prefer to consume in period one. right? Because if I plan to consume in period two, I might die. And then I, even though I leave a bequest, it's not as good as consuming. right? So I, I would really prefer to consume to consume in period one. But then if I consume in period one, it's dangerous. So you have these two offsetting effects. Um, so you can see that when you compare an economy with no death with an economy with death, you always consume less in period one in the economy where when I, when I consume, I increase my, my mortality risk, right? Because I want to self-protect. So you can see this self-protection here. And then if I have a lot of intertemporal substitution, this is when I'm willing to intertemporally substitute a lot. Um, well, then actually, you know, for risk aversion of two in this graph here, I'm keeping risk, risk aversion equal to two and we're changing intertemporal substitution. When I'm very willing to substitute, they ended up consuming very little in period one. Then I don't have much risk of dying and then I consume everything, everything in period two. Um, you can see a different setup here um, with, with risk aversion. So first of all, um, the degree of risk aversion doesn't matter when there's no death because there's no uncertainty. So that's why uh, this line is flat. Um, you see when risk aversion is very high, I, want, I end up consuming a lot in period one. And why is that? Because now consuming in period two is a, is a gamble, right? I might get a bad outcome where, where I die and, and, and I end up not enjoying consumption. And so I'm very risk averse against that gamble. And because of that, I ended up consuming more in period one. So this shows you the, the impact of intertemporal substitution and, and, and risk aversion. These are the parameters we're going to use. We're going to use um, an inverse elasticity of intertemporal substitution, uh, an elasticity of intertemporal substitution, let me say it that way, of one and a half. And we're going to have a risk aversion of two. So this is kind of where we're going we're to be. So you can see that in the model, you're going to self-protect. Uh, you're going to reduce your consumption. So, so this is kind of just a simple two-period example. Um, I'm going to show you a quantitative model. I'm just sketch it out for you. And then we're going to ask the question, uh, how, how much would be peeling, people willing to pay to avoid COVID? We always ask that about recessions, and in most models, you, people are willing to pay only a tiny bit. We're going to ask the question for COVID. Morten. If, if you could, um, if you could uh, do an inter vivos transfer, you would always, wouldn't you always want to do it here? If you could do, I, I people it want to consume. Because like, if there's a night. Like. People want to consume, right, Morten? I want to consume. So actually leaving a bequest is a consolation prize. <laughs> but I really want to consume. I'm kind of selfish. Uh, it turns out that I don't mind leaving money to my kids, but that's not my primary, uh, my primary driver. I really want to consume tomorrow, you see? But of course, if you, if you don't have a bequest, then you're, you're going to load a lot of consumption to, today because if, if you die tomorrow, then you lose your money and there's no utility. So that's the sense in which you need the bequest motive. But the bequest motive is not the main driver of savings. The main driver of savings is I'm, consuming for, I'm, I'm saving to consume in the future. So consumption is always better than, than, than leaving a bequest. Uh, again, if not, you want to kill yourself. So that's the problem, uh, to leave a bequest. No, I was... I was I was thinking that second condition, if I could leave an inter vivos transfer. Oh, you mean giving money without, I understand, yeah. giving money without, without dying. Yeah. But you'd prefer to consume. Right. So you would never do it, right? Yeah. I mean, the way we set it up. Um, all right. So I, I want to claim my impeccable general equilibrium uh, credentials. I mean, I've worked with general equilibrium for, I don't know, more years than I care to confess. And so I, it, this is only the second time that I use partial equilibrium model. You might think that I've lost my way. I mean, Patrick is looking at me with an air of disappointment. Um, but I think there is very good... I think general equilibrium is overrated because general equilibrium is always great if you have a model that's fantastic. 
because otherwise, you know, we have the wrong effects, right? Even though it's completely consistent. So here, I think it's very important that we face people with the actual wage rates and interest rates and, and, and also sequence of infections that are in the data. And, and you need a very sophisticated model, perhaps, to do that. So I'm just going to face people with sort of exogenous, a series of exogenous wages, interest rates, and perhaps importantly, a probability of getting infected. Um, there's going to be only two groups in the model, uh, old and young. Again, I think an important refinement in a, in a revision is to call the old experienced. Um, and we, just to, for consistency, we're going to we're going to use stochastic aging. Uh, aging. So, so with some probability, the young become old, so that we only have two groups, right? So otherwise, you'd have to keep track of many groups, right? And there will be a big mess, and probably it would not add much, but it would add a lot of numerical complication. Um, just as in the SEER model, that is the basis for a lot of epidemiology work, we're going to have four uh, health categories. So people that are susceptible, they have no immunity against the virus. If they get in contact with someone who's infected, they might catch the disease. These are the people that are already infected. Um, the susceptible people cannot die from the disease yet because they have not been infected, but once we are infected, we can either recover uh, or die. So we're going to keep the labor supply exogenous because remember, as we discussed, we are looking at civil servants, so they don't really have much uh, control over the hours they, they work. And um, the real wage is going gonna, is gonna to be constant. And this is their budget constraint, so they, they can save in the form of, of bond holdings, and their bond holdings tomorrow are the wage they receive today, the bond holdings today uh, times one plus the interest rate, and this is the, uh, we're going to subtract their consumption. So the, the, the way you link the economy to the epidemics in these models that we worked on is you have the probability of getting infected depends on two components. There's an endogenous component, depends on how much consumption uh, we, we decide to have, because you know consumption is dangerous. If I go out to a shopping center, then I'm again in contact with someone who has the virus. And then there's also, you know, I might meet someone in the elevator or in the park and then I get infected. Um, so just a little bit of uh, discussion of expectations. We do something very, very simple as far as the expectations of what's going to happen. So the first thing is to, to, op to get this going in the model, we have to compute the time series for infections, right? This is aggregate infections. So this is how dangerous it is to be out there. Uh, this I cannot avoid. I mean, we, we just discussed it a little bit. You know, perhaps I, I get into contact with someone who's, who's infected. If there's a lot of people infected, that's more likely to happen. And this is the, the risk of getting infected when I go and when I go and consume. So the, first of all, we're going to com uh, uh, compute the number of infections uh, using the, the COVID death data, right? There's still measurement there in that data, but it's probably a better way to do than to use the uh, official estimates of infections, right? So we're going to look at the number of people that died from COVID. We're going to look at the mortality rate. There's a time series for mortality rate. I'll talk a little bit about that. And with the mortality rate, you can infer how many people were infected two weeks before, more or less. So that's, that's, uh, that's how we do it. Uh, we solve the model in two ways. The results that I'm going to show you um, uh, are constructed in the following way. People have perfect foresight with respect to the first wave, but they think it's going to be over. And then um, in, the, in the week of June, uh, um, June 28, uh, 20, uh, I'm sorry, June 28, 20, uh, June 21, 2020. Um, then they learn there's another, there's another two waves. So they are they have perfect foresight with respect to the first wave. Then after the first wave, as an unexpected shock, they learn there's two more waves. So this is the way we're going to solve the model because the two more the two waves were largely unanticipated. But we also solve the model under perfect foresight. And of course, you could do a combination. Uh, you could do something more sophisticated here. So, but we also have perfect foresight. And it doesn't, turns out not to matter that much. So, so if I show you perfect foresight from the beginning until the end of the episode, or the way we did it, we have perfect foresight for the first wave, but not, not with respect to the other waves. The results are actually not, not so different. I, I wonder if in the first wave, you, we can't think that of that as a time when People are highly uncertain about it. Said that you don't see the little lump until later. So they're highly uncertain about what... Uh, you know, I'm glad that we, we rehearsed, uh, Larry, because it's a very useful comment. I mean, that rehearsal yesterday, that's exactly where we're going to go, right? We're going to talk about what were people's expectations of the first wave, because that's how we're going to... Oh, you're going to talk about that? We're going to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, okay. okay. It, it seems so natural, I mean, the way you put it. Um, so here's to Larry's question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this slide was not even here, I just rearranged it so that it would appear in sequence. Um, 
So this is exactly what Larry was, was saying, uh, that people are uncertain, right? So in the beginning, we were very scared. So the way we're going to actually uh, uh, explain what we see in the data is through this freak-out effect. You know, we are, as Larry was saying, we're, st we're stuck at home. Uh, people in Europe, in particular, were seeing all these deaths in Italy. I mean, per per first, you know, what happened in China. Then here, I think, in, in, if you were in Europe, you were always seeing... Uh, uh, the impact of, of COVID on, uh, in, in Italy and a lot, a lot of people dying and, uh, and so forth. So what we're going to assume is people do not know what the case fatality rate is. And they have some prior of, of how dangerous the disease is. We're going to estimate those priors because we, we don't know what they are. We're going to assume, uh, I mean, just like Larry talked about yesterday, we're going to assume they are going to uh, use a simple learning algorithm. They're going to use a constant gain algorithm. So they are going to observe uh, actual deaths, and they are going to gradually uh, change their change their expectations. Um, just that is, it is very. This is common in, in learning algorithms, which is I'm going to learn, but as of today, I, I don't expect to learn in the future. You see, I expect today. I think that I know what the case fatality rate is. Then tomorrow, I happen to change my mind, and I keep on going like that. Um, oops. Oh yeah, for sure, yes, sir. I wonder why you need to add this because I, I mean I, I think you I mean the point is, is is perfect. So there are two ways where consumption drops in the same way, but in the first is because of uncertainty. But because you already have the Epstein zine and there is um, an equivalence between Epstein zine and Hansen Sargent um, robustness. So I think in my view you don't need this. Additional well, I'm going to show you what happens if I don't if we don't have it. Right, okay, so then. I thought you can just change the parameter of the epsilon zin and put it in a way that you have more uncertainty in the first period and less uncertainty in the second. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but I'll, sh yeah, I'll show you. Okay. I'll show you what happens if I take if I take it away. But then then we will not be able to get close to the data. Maybe not. I'm <laughs> just thinking. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay, so this is, uh, this is the, going to be the, the utility function. So I showed you a two-period version. Uh, this is now uh, an infinite horizon model, but with probability of death. So, so people have a certain life expectancy. Um, so, so let's take just a quick look at this, at this equation. So first, there's a weird thing, right? Isn't it? There's a constant. I mean, why do we have a, co why do we have a constant to the utility function, right? If you maximize a function and then you add a constant to the function, the maximum is the same. But here, remember, it really matters to have positive utility. You want positive lifetime utility because you don't want to give people an incentive to kill themselves. Since they can do that here, you could just go out and consume. You could go to a movie theater uh, or a sports event if, if it was available. So this is very common, uh, actually. Uh, Chad Jones and Bob Hall have this in, 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 a, in a classic paper. You know, you, you want to keep lifetime utility positive. So that's what this is doing here. This is the way we model containment. You could model containment in a variety of ways. I mean, Mick brought it up, but um, I think containment is important. And here we're going to model it. I mean, we sort of model it in different ways in different papers. But here we, we model it in a way that containment reduces utility. You know, in the sense, you know, I, it's, it's, it's true that I can get takeout from restaurants instead of, instead of getting the meal, the meal at the restaurant, but now the meal comes home and it's cold. Um, so consumption is less enjoyable if you're you know, streaming instead of going to the theater. You know, I, I perhaps have to drive farther away to get the stuff that I want because the stores are closed, because many stores are closed because of containment. So we're, we're modeling it as, as reducing, reducing utility. So this is the certainty equivalent of future, future utility. Alpha is risk aversion. Rho is the inverse of intertemporal substitution. And so this mu t is a stand-in for for containment. I want to show you uh, the, 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 the lifetime utility of, of, of all the agents, but I actually have here the most complicated one, which is the person that, that is young and susceptible. It looks like the title of a novel, right? And, and this is actually the person that has the most to lose. First of all, they are young, and in this model you age, so you might lose your, your youth, and then you are susceptible, and so it can only go downhill. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you might get infected and, and, and you might die, right? And these are all the transitions. Again, let me not take you through them, but of course, this is, a, this is a, you know, I, I'm still young and susceptible, so this is very good, because I didn't die of natural causes, I did not age, and I did not get infected. And then you go through all, through all the transitions, right? Um, these people cannot die from COVID because if I'm not infected with COVID, I can still not die. I might die in the future from COVID, but not today. But I might die of natural causes, so that's why you have the, you have the bequest over here. So you can see you have to keep track of all these transitions. Um, 
So that's the, the bequest utility that I've already talked a little bit about. Uh, and the, the, way, the reason we have this functional form that's very much used in these overlapping generation models is because you want to be consistent with the fact that people leave large asset holdings. And then also, um, consumption of older people is lower than consumption of young people. This really helps you uh, uh, be consistent with that, uh, with that fact. So we're going to calibrate some models and estimate others. We're going to use Bayesian, uh, Bayesian methods to, ex to estimate six parameters. Uh, and we're going to, uh, the most important parameters are perhaps the priors. So because we don't know, we're, we're going to try to have the model decide what was in, in people's heads when, when, the, when the epidemic started, just as Larry was articulating. And then we're also going to estimate how quickly they learn, how much they adjust uh, the priors to what they are observing. Um, we're going to have a, a constant that controls how important containment was. Uh, and then we're also going to have a, a constant that controls how infectious consumption was, you know, how, much, how, how dangerous was, was, was consumption. Um, so the way we're going to estimate the model uh, is essentially uh, as follows. You know, there's, going to, there's a mapping between these parameters that I just described to you and the, the, uh, that graph that I showed you, which is the impact of COVID over time. So, so this is a mapping from in the model from the parameters to how people of different ages responded to COVID. And what we want to do is we want to get the model as close to the data. These are estimates in the data, and we're going to treat this as just data. And we're, we're going to try to fit. We're going to try to choose parameters so that the implications of the model are as close as possible to the data. That's essentially uh, what we are doing. So we're going to re-estimate the data just with two groups to make it simple. So we're going to uh, cut at age 60, and the young are lower than 60. It's a group that Marty and I, unfortunately, no longer belong to. Uh, only Matthias. And then uh, we're going to have the experienced group, which is above, uh, above, uh, above 60. So this is the same picture that I showed before. This is the data. And this is the data we're going to try to match. All right, so we have two groups. Uh, younger than 60, between 20 and 60, and then between 60 and, and 79. And you can see now very clearly with only two groups, the older people, um, you know, they, they cut their expenditure more. So we, we already uh, you know, yeah, see this very well, that this is a bigger wave, but, you know, the cutting consumption is actually not as, not as big as in the first wave. So this is that containment wedge. So we're going to measure containment, and then the, the model is going to estimate how important is containment in terms of utility. So that's going to allow us to take into account in the model the effect of containment, right? Because containment reduces utility. So as Mick was saying, maybe I'm cutting my consumption just because of uh, containment measures. So this is our uh, data for containment. So we went through the... Uh, uh, detailed data on, on the containment measures that were implemented. And in particular, we constructed this, um, this time series using the number of businesses that were closed. So shops that were closed, restaurants that were closed, and so forth. And sometimes they were closed on the weekends. Sometimes there are restrictions on the number of people that could be in, in stores and so forth. So on the basis of that, we, we introduced containment. And you can see one interesting thing also is that containment is similar in the two waves. Even though the second wave was much worse, actually the containment was, was very similar. So the containment measures were reintroduced and, and they were about the same, the same in, in the two waves. So again, containment by itself cannot explain why consumption didn't drop by more in the, in the second wave because it was similar in the two waves. The second wave was a lot more dangerous. So uh, uh, containment by itself cannot explain the facts. Okay, this is a bunch of parameters. The, uh, an important one is the basic... Uh, Reproduction uh, are not uh, that measures the number of the number of people that one infected person can infect uh, in in his or her lifetime, and so this is a very infectious disease. This is are the estimates of the CDC. It's 2.5, so one person will end up in infecting 2.5. So this is why in the beginning, the the, the infection they spreads spreads like crazy. Right, then we have a series of other parameters that just come from mortality, from normal, you know, non-COVID causes, uh, aging probability, which has, has to do with the average difference between the age of, of young and old, uh, wages, interest rates, and so forth. Uh, we also um, calibrate those parameters of the bequest function and that constant in, in lifetime utility 
to match three targets. One is that the young consume 1.2 uh, times more than the old, 20% more than the old. Um, the average savings rate in the economy is 6.7%. And then this is the value of life, um, the average value of life that's used in Portugal when they do public works. So countries, I mean, there's estimates like this for the United States. The estimates for the United States are much, much higher. Of course, the United States has also much higher income than Portugal does. And this is the number that's used in Portugal. When, when you build a highway or something like that and you reduce the probability of dying, this is how you value, uh, how val you value those savings. So um, uh, we've seen declines in, in case fatality rates throughout the, the episode. And so this is a, estimates by a paper by Sorensen and co-authors where they estimate that throughout the, uh, our data in Portugal, actually, uh, the case fatality rate fell by about 36%. Right? So this is a combination of perhaps better treatment. People, doctors learn uh, how, how, how to treat the epidemic. So we incorporate this in the model, uh, but let me tell you, it does not have a first order effect. So if we run the model with just constant case fatality rate, uh, the effects are not very different. And the reason is that the true case fatality rate, which in the model people are learning about, is actually relatively small. Anyway, so if it's small, uh, we see if people knew the case fatality rate, they would not have reacted that much. The fact that then it falls over time is really a second order, a second order effect. Um, so we, we calibrate the economy so 70% of people are young. Uh, you know, we give them assets that are the average initial assets in the economy. Um, these are the posteriors of the estimated parameters. So you see the data is very informative. Uh, we give uh, the, the, the priors are, are uniform priors, and you can see the, the algorithm finds very, uh, very sharp estimates. It's very, very, it's very opinionated as to which parameters it wants to, it wants to see. And so this is, the, this is the, our estimates of the priors. And, and as Larry was saying, in the beginning, people don't know how likely they are to die if they get infected. And what you see here is people really freaking out, right? They think it's very likely they will die. So, so then I cut my consumption a lot because this is a very, very dangerous disease. You, what is, what this is the case fatality rate is the probability of dying if you are infected. So remember, there's two groups. There's people between age 20 and age 60, and then, uh, or age 59, and then people from age 60 until to age 79. And so the blue is the young, and the red is the old. So the, the, dashed, bar, the dashed lines are um, the data, and the solid lines are the model. So you see the model does a pretty good job. I mean, there are some things the model does not get. So one interesting thing is you see young people with crazy in the summer. Right? Our models generally are not good at capturing this kind of pent-up effect that I didn't go to the beach and I did not have a good time and now, you know, all of a sudden I, I, I go crazy. So that, that uh, the model does not capture. But it does capture very well the fact that the old cut by more than the young in both waves and that even though this was much more dangerous, um, the, the cut in, in consumption was commensurate exactly because what Larry was saying, that by the time we get here, we are much more realistic about case, case fatality rates. So that's the, the explanation that the model uh, puts together. Um, so this is one of the many things you can do, is to ask the question, suppose, what is the pure effect of containment? And so one simple way to do it, because remember, we don't have a general equilibrium model, so we cannot take off containment and then figure out what happens to infections and make the economy less dangerous or anything like that. So we don't have the feedback from containment to the danger, danger of the economy through infections because it's partially equilibrium. But what we can do is we can run the model without the, infect, without the epidemic, and that's what we did here. So suppose you just impose containment. This is the containment we estimate in the data, and we don't have any epidemic. So this shows you the impact of containment on consumption. And you can see it's the mirror image of the picture that I showed you because containment measures are very similar in the two waves. Then you'd cut consumption in a similar way. Also, you can see containment affects the same way young and old. So it would not explain the differential. So it neither explains the differential nor does it explain why the two drops in consumption are commensurate even though this was a much more dangerous wave. Right? That makes sense. Um, all right, so then this is the answer to Esther's question, right? So, it's, so she asked, well, can you just do it with Epstein-Zinn? And so this actually, we, we, we tried to do it, right? Because we re-estimated the model, so we're giving the model the best shot uh, at fitting the data. And you see it's really impossible because the model has to choose. It cannot fit these two waves, you see. You have to choose which one you're going to fit. Ah. Uh, 
probabilities, you can back them up from the epsilon it's in, and they depend on the parameters. And so, I mean, it would be still the, the parameters of, of utility. The parameters that you put on the future utility, because these are the ones that determine. But you change them from the first wave to the second. Exactly. I mean, it would still be a dog. I'm not. Right, I mean, right. But I'm just saying, rather than adding one element. You yeah, I mean, so, so, but yeah, perhaps, because now we have but more parameters. Be, you yeah. have more parameters. Yeah, but Esther, the other way you could go, which we did, is to say they really are, they, they really care about uncertainty, and uncertainty came down yeah. as opposed to the point of. That's what the upside in Zin does. So you, if you change the, the parameter, so the parameters on the future value function. You can back, to, there is an equivalence with the yeah, yes, Hansen and Sargent Hans probabilities, and you can show that if sigma goes up, the Hansen and Sargent probabilities go up. So that's why I'm saying this probability you put in, you can back it up. But it, it's equivalent. I mean, it's just. Right, right, right. Now, here we did something simpler because we are keeping preferences constant, right? So the preferences are constant. And you can see that the estimation algorithm has to choose, it ends up choosing to fit this wave over here. But when you fit this wave over here, then you don't fit this one. Right. You cannot fit, we cannot fit both of them. Um, so one question is, can the model also explain the differences across income? And this is not part of the estimation. There's people that think you get bonus points if you fit something you did not target. There's other people that think, no, bonus points are not warranted. I am agnostic as part in this. So I don't know whether this generates bonus points or not, but this was not something we targeted in the estimation. And you can see the model does pretty well, particularly in these two categories. So you can see the model does pretty well at fitting the middle income and, and uh, the high income. It doesn't do as well at fitting the, the, the low income. Uh, and you can see the model predicts bigger declines um, bigger declines in consumption. And the reason is that in the model we don't have transfers that people in low income got. So these people got transfers from the government, and we think that's why the model is, is, is missing in this, uh, in this category of income. So we have the model. I mean, it does, a, 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 I think, a pretty good job at, at fitting the data. And now we're going to ask the question to the model, because we cannot interview agents, so it's easier always to interview a model. How much would people in the model be willing to pay um, to get all this nightmare of COVID uh, out of the way? And so these are the different income groups in the economy. We're looking at different uh, levels of income. And this is the willingness to pay of old and young. And you can see, first, they are willing to pay a lot. I mean, it's not like a small fraction of my consumption, which is a typical business cycle. You know, we put so much effort, so much love into these models, and then in the end, the, the, the ungrateful agents in the model, they don't care. <laughs> they don't think it's such a big deal. Um, but here, here they care because it's life and death, you see. So even the young are willing to give a big fraction of their income to get this COVID to go away. Of course, the old are always willing to pay more because they are much more at risk. And the richer you are, the more you're willing to, uh, you're willing to pay. Of course, that's the kind of thing that non-economists consider crass, but the value of life goes up with the level of income and people have more to lose, therefore they are willing to pay more uh, to avoid it. Um, so then the last thing I want to show you, I, how am I doing on time, Stefan? I have no time, so, uh, but you, you're letting me go, so, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> So um, uh, I'll try to finish quickly. So the, the last thing we do is, is we ask the question of what happens. Now, we estimated um, you know, the parameters and so forth, and, and we're going to use this, this information to figure out what happens if COVID becomes endemic, which seems what seems to have happened. Right? So how do you make COVID endemic? Um, in, in these models, you get to this, the famous herd immunity that was so much discussed uh, during the epidemic, because in the standard SEER model, once you recover from the infection, so infection is a gamble. It's a very tough gamble because we can die or we can recover. But it, the good news in that model is if I recover from the infection, I can never get the disease again. I get permanent immunity. So then you can do some calculations, and after a certain number of people have acquired the immunity, then basically the, uh, you reach herd immunity. And then from then on, it's like magic. Uh, the number of infected people uh, you know, declines and asymptotically goes, goes to zero, right? So here what we're going to do is we're going to look at a setting where if I am recovered, I can lose my immunity. And I, can, I become susceptible again. So in that case, there's a positive number of infections in the steady state. In the standard SEER model, uh, in, the, in the steady state, asymptotically, there's going to be no infections, right? Because uh, herd immunity uh, takes place. But here there's, there's no such thing. Um, so, you know, 
let me not go through the details of the model, but it's commensurate to the model that I showed you, except that here we also have labor supply and, and capital accumulation. And now let me show you kind of the results. So, so uh, we, we run results under two possible scenarios. The first one is supposing the model, people had their pr were using their priors, the priors that we estimated, and they were using them to make decisions. So, of course, these priors are extremely exaggerated. People think COVID is really dangerous. So then you see the impact on output to be enormous. You know, you'd lose 5% per year in perpetuity. So a huge impact, right? And that's kind of commensurate to the very large impact of the initial wave of COVID. But if you, you, you were using true case fatality rates, which, which presumably by then you would have learned, because it's a, you have a long period of time, you can... Uh, observe a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, data on deaths and infections and so forth. So if you now actually know the true case fatality rate, the results will be minimal. And this is very consistent with the, that those results of Asimoglu and Johnson, which when you look at more, uh, declines in mortality, they don't seem to have a big impact on output. Here we also find you know, relatively modest impacts. And, but of course, if you, if you went with the initial priors, the, the impacts would be, would be enormous. All right, so let me, let me end. Thank you for the extra time. Um, so we, we're, we're trying to use data that we think can measure pretty well kind of what happened in terms of uh, consumer responses to the, um, to the epidemic. And, and I've, I've already discussed, and we, we discussed it a little bit, what, what is the key thing in the data, these two different waves being very different in terms of, of the probability of becoming infected and the, the declines in consumption being commensurate in the two waves. So the way we explain that is through very pessimistic prior beliefs. Then we showed you that if people know the actual case fatality rates, the impact of COVID on economic activity are actually relatively small, something uh, on the order of a quarter of, uh, of 1%. And then the last thing, that, the last thought that I'll leave you with, and thank you so much for all the questions and, and all, the, uh, all, all, your, all your comments. Um, but the last, the last thought that I'll leave you with is, in, you know, in the first paper that we wrote, and, you know, and many other people also wrote papers along those lines, you know, we, we made the, the point that you know, an infection is an externality, right? So you want, uh, you want public, uh, public intervention, you, know, you want containment or some, some sort of public action because there's an externality component to it. If I go to consume and I'm infected, you know, then I might infect a, a, bunch, a bunch of other people. Um, and so in, in that first paper, we also, we also computed what was the optimal policy, you know, what was the optimal Pigouvian tax on consumption, uh, which was a form, a form of containment. You could do containment in a variety of ways. But now, it, this paper makes things a lot more difficult because in that paper, and I think almost all of the literature, assumed rational expectations, which is from day one, everybody knows everything, and they particularly know the case fatality rates. But to explain the data, we cannot go with full information on rational expectations. We have to assume uncertainty with respect to, the, to case fatality rates. Now, if we don't know true case fatality rates, and I think it's reasonable to assume that the government doesn't know either, now it's not clear what's going on, and you have to use robust control or some kind of night and uncertainty analysis to figure out what the optimal policy and that is certainly something interesting to think about. Stefan is going to take me out of the way and I'm... Uh... Thank you very much Sergio.